Thanks, Nas. Well, um, as I mentioned at the start, we're beginning a brand new series for this summer term in the book of Colossians. So if you've got a Bible um, or a phone or tablet or whatever, turn there to Colossians. And we're going to begin today just with the first eight verses in Colossians 1. This is the living word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Morning, everybody. Great to see you. It's wonderful uh, to be here together. Let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, we thank you that your Spirit continues to speak to us today through the words of the Bible. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to focus and concentrate. And whether we're new to these things or very familiar with them, help us to understand what you're saying to us now through this passage. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ here, I wonder if I could um, begin by asking you a question. Do some people make your faith in Christ feel inadequate? Do some people make your faith in Christ feel inadequate? I I don't mean unbelievers who are sceptical about the whole thing, or people of other faiths who just disagree. I mean people who call themselves Christians but have a very different approach and make your faith in the Jesus of the Bible seem simplistic and inadequate perhaps suggesting that you need to modernise your beliefs to catch up with contemporary culture, Uh, or perhaps suggesting you need to grow into a more ceremonial and sacramental discipline, or perhaps suggesting you should explore their spiritual experiences of visions and angels. And there may be family, or there may be friends, or there may be a ministry on the internet. They may even be very well-intentioned, but it really is quite a different approach to your faith in Jesus. They don't question the value of your initial faith in Jesus Christ of the Bible, but they're wanting to offer you something extra. They're offering, wanting to offer you something to broaden and to bring greater fullness to your spiritual experience than your faith in Christ uh, can bring. For example, I recall when I was uh, training at Bible College in Oxford um, many centuries ago now, but Um, choosing to be placed um, for one year at a church in a very different uh, Christian tradition uh, to my own in order to better understand my own faith. And I remember uh, being invited to what was called a a Holy Spirit weekend. And there I was to be coached in how to receive more gifts from the Holy Spirit. The people I met at this church uh, were genuinely lovely people and and, um, I was very very grateful for their kindness to me. But as I stood with a crowd in prayer with my hands open and opening my heart to God to receive more spiritual gifts, which of course are wonderful things to receive from God, but I realized that I was really being given the message that my simple faith in Christ really wasn't enough and I really needed to learn uh, from those who were hosting um, the weekend to unlock the fullness of of, uh, what God wanted me to experience because what I had through faith in Christ wasn't enough, and they were just longing for me to learn their way. Well, I don't know, have you, have you ever met people who, who make 
you feel like that, you feel like your, your faith in Christ is, is kind of inadequate, not enough. I ask that because um, we know from this New Testament book of Colossians, which was a letter to a church in a town called Colossae in what is now Western Turkey, uh, from the great apostle Paul in about 60 AD, that some teachers had arrived in the town of Colossae who were making the Christians there feel that they needed more than faith in Christ. They needed extra that the false teachers could provide them to enjoy the fullness of God's salvation. So let's begin the, ser- the, the sermons um, in Colossians considering uh, the introduction, which is an opportunity to try and get inside what was happening in Colossae, because I think it's quite familiar to us uh, today. So l- look at verse 1. Uh, Paul, we read, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. So Paul, an apostle, verse 1, is in prison hearing from Epaphras. Um, and we know about Epaphras from the end of the letter. Now, h- here in verse 1, we find that as in other letters from Paul, where there are false teachers around who might mislead the Christians, Paul is a bit more formal like this. You know, a pot, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. is basically not just a warm hug, he's handing out his business card. He's saying, I'm an apostle by the will of God. Um, Apostle means messenger. In other words, he was one of Christ's foundational teachers, authorized and empowered by Jesus personally to speak and write for him with authority. He says, by the will of God. That is not just like the false teachers, self-proclaimed or, or very popular, but he's saying, I was appointed by God. And he's writing with his younger colleague, Timothy, who interestingly would soon be appointed to lead the nearby church in Ephesus, from which the church in Colossae presumably grew. In other words, he's saying that the Colossians can trust Paul and they can quote Paul in their debates with the false teachers because he is speaking for God. And we know from the end of the letter that Paul is writing from prison. He says, remember my chains, uh, probably in Rome. And although he's never met the Colossians himself... Uh, we read that their founding pastor, who's called Epaphras, who's mentioned here in our reading in verse 7, has come to see Paul in prison with another member of the church, Onesimus, in other words, to take counsel with Paul, to get guidance from Paul from what to do about the situation that's emerging in Colossae with these visiting teachers who are bringing a very different approach to his simple approach of teaching Christ from the Bible. Verse 2, he says, To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul is affirming his Christian readers here with some beautiful descriptions. He recognizes they are God's holy people. Because if we are trusting in Jesus, we are God's holy people. That is, we are set apart and special to God. We are his special, purified people. And he calls them faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, God's beloved children through faith in Christ. Because if we're trusting in Jesus, that's what we are. We we are God's children and we're family, we're brothers and sisters through our faith in Jesus, the Son of God. Notice he calls them faithful because clearly he's convinced by what he's heard from Epaphras. Remember, he's never met them, but Epaphras, their founding pastor, has come to tell him all about them. And as he's listened to Epaphras describing their life in Colossae, he realizes that they're wonderfully loyal to Christ. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 5, he will say, I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So he says, you're clearly faithful believers. Yet when we read in chapter 4, verse 12, again at the end, we find that, as so often in his letters, it's the final greeting of the letter. You kind of need to read ahead if you can and get to the end. It's in the final bit where he's making his farewells that he tells us all the circumstances of what's going on. And there we read that Epaphras, their church leader, is always wrestling, that is literally agonizing, in prayer for the Colossians, as all good Christian leaders should do. He says that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. 
But if they're standing firm in faith already, why is Epaphras wrestling in agonized prayer for them that they will remain firm? Why is Epaphras so worried about the church? The answer is because even healthy and strong Christians can be made to feel that their faith in Christ is inadequate by distorted versions of Christianity that tell them that what they've got is not enough. And indeed, that's what will emerge in chapter 2. We'll look at this in in coming weeks. But he says in chapter 2, verses 4 to 23, he says, don't be deceived by fine-sounding arguments. He goes on to say, don't be captured by their human ideology or condemned by their religious disciplines or disqualified by their spiritual experiences. It's plain that some very fine-sounding but misguided and potentially dangerous false teachers had arrived in Colossae. And so Paul will say in chapter 2, verse 8, See to it no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition. In other words, those who are adapting their faith to contemporary human ideology, uh, which is often called liberal teaching. And then in chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat and drink or with regard to a religious festival. In other words, don't let yourself feel condemned for a lack of ceremonial discipline and sacramental life. Uh, For example, you may find that in some some Anglo-Catholic traditions uh, at the moment. Or in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. In other words, he's saying, don't let yourself feel disqualified by other people's magnificent experiences of angels and visions. God may well have blessed them, but don't allow yourself to feel inadequate as if faith in Jesus is not enough. Uh, You find that in some uh, versions of of charismatic um, tradition in, in our country at the moment. Instead, Paul's letter celebrates what we have in Jesus Christ. He will celebrate in this letter the supremacy and the sufficiency, the all-round wonderfulness of Jesus. And we'll say, if we've got Christ, then whatever other people's experiences are, we have the fullness of God in Christ. In fact, Paul's whole letter is about that. He wants to tell the Colossians in this letter, and we get to read uh, over here his letter. He wants to tell us how magnificent Christ is. He's so magnificent. When you get how wonderful Jesus is, you'll realize you don't need anything else but him. He is everything that we need. And so just as we sort of begin this this series, it's worth you knowing that chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 is recognized as the kind of central message of the letter. And There we read Paul saying this, Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, that's the gospel, Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. In other words, the more you discover how wonderful Jesus Christ is, you will overflow with thankfulness and you'll be less prone to feel inadequate by what everybody else is going on about in their lives. Now, I'm no gardener, but even I know that When you plant a young tree in good soil, the worst thing you can do is to keep uprooting it and moving it. And Paul writes this letter to reassure the Colossian Christians that they're like young trees who've been planted in the good soil of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, they need to grow deeper roots. They need to grow up taller in him. They need to grow stronger in Jesus, full of thankfulness for all that God is in Christ, but not moving away from Christ. The message of the whole letter is that Christ is absolutely wonderful. Jesus is mind-blowingly good. And we have all of, of God in him. And so the message of the letter is stand firm. Christ is all you need. Don't let other people tell you that there's something inadequate in faith in Christ. And so here in this opening paragraph, his opening report of his prayers for these young believers... He offers them three loving reassurances that are such an encouragement to us. If we've begun to put our faith in Jesus Christ, these are three encouragements for us. The first one is this. 
He says, you're genuine Christians, for you have faith, love, and hope. You're genuine Christians, for you have faith, love, and hope. This is verse um, 3 to 5. So again, if you've got a a passage there, you could look at verse 3 with me. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. He says, in other words, we're so grateful to God for his saving work in you. So if you're a Christian here, it's as if Paul is saying, I'm so grateful to God for what he has done in you. Unlike the false teachers who are very eager to improve you with their ideology, which is perhaps a reminder to us all in a very critical cancel culture, eager to call out the sins of others, to perhaps be a bit less eager to critique other people, improve them with our insights, and perhaps be a bit more eager to thank God for his saving work in other people. I wonder when the last time was that we thanked God for the other people in this room. We thanked God for what he's done in other people's lives. Um, Rather than wanting to improve them. But, But then what are the marks of God's saving work in a person? Is it an expertise in human philosophy? Impressive religious disciplines? Host of visionary experiences? as the false teachers were claiming. Look at verse 4. We're thankful because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. In other words, Paul looks for a familiar trinity of virtues as evidence of God's saving work in someone's life. Here there are three things to look for in yourself and in others. Faith, hope, and love. And you get these three mentioned so often in the New Testament. Romans 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 Corinthians 13. For as children look like their parents, so real Christians have these characteristic virtues. They're, if you like, they're the birthmarks of God's children. Faith, love, and hope. First he says faith in Christ. That is a continuing trust in Jesus' death for our sins so we can be forgiven and of his resurrection to heaven, so that we can be justified or accepted by God in his life that has been accepted into heaven for us. Not relying on our own religious performance, not relying on our own ministry, but relying on Jesus. We have a faith in Christ as our saviour. Then he says, love for all God's people. That is, our faith in Christ will be expressed in a growing affection for other believers which will be evident in sacrificial service, like praying for other people and practical help for other people in time of need. It's worth recognising as many evangelical leaders are being exposed at the moment, very sadly, for abusive patterns of leadership. It's not just biblical truth, but also sacrificial love that is evidence of God's work in a person's life. And we need to learn to prize love as highly as truth in our leaders. Because it's not just faith in the truth, it's also love towards other people that is a mark of God's work in someone's life. Not only faith and love, but also hope. Hope stored up for you in heaven. The inheritance that God grants to all his people of a joyful eternity with him and his vast multicultural family in what he calls the kingdom of light in verse 12. Notice he says, our faith in Christ and our love for others derive from this hope of inheritance. It's interesting, normally he, he, he writes in the New Testament about faith, love, and, uh, faith, hope and love, but here he changes the order and goes faith, love and then hope. I mean, perhaps I'm being a bit obsessive, but I think it's deliberate. He says, our faith and our love derive from this hope of inheritance because it's the eternal joy with his people that Christ has won for us that both drew us to place our faith in Jesus and fuels our commitment to one another because we're going to be living together for a very, very long time. And um, we, we kind of want to invest. It's, we want to invest in one another because there's eternity together. We're family now. Indeed, Paul emphasizes hope in this letter. Rather than faith or love, as in other letters, 
Perhaps because he wants his readers, who are under pressure, to resist the enticing emphasis of the false teachers upon their intellectual and religious experiences in recognizing, recognizing that the supreme joys of life as a Christian are promised for the future in the new creation. It is wonderful to know Jesus now, but life can still be very, very hard now. Very hard. And the false teachers are promising that everything will be marvelous for you now if you come to their, their approach. And Paul is saying, actually, the Christian life is often about waiting and living by hope for the future that is promised to us. Many false versions of Christianity are seductive because they promise spiritual success and satisfaction now. But real Christianity promises faith in Christ, which does make life good now. And it does bring the joy of loving other people. But nevertheless, it derives from patient hope that is waiting for a glorious future inheritance in heaven. There's much about being a Christian which is about patiently waiting for the future that's been promised to us. And so it's a bit like the telltale watermarks in a £20 banknote. So, oh no, that's 10. Sorry, it's the wrong one. I've got two in my pocket. Oh, there's another 10. I'm sure I've got a 20 somewhere. It doesn't actually matter. It's always fun watching the past to get it. Oh, there's another 10. I'm going to change the illustration. It's about the telltale watermarks in a £10 note. <laughs> oh dear, oh well. So here, have you ever seen shop, shopkeepers sort of do this? You know, maybe it's just me, I look shifty or something, but they kind of, you know, they look at it and they sort of, I don't actually know what they're looking for, but I do, I can see that in, in, the, in the 10 pound note, there are all kinds of sort of telltale details. I mean, it's incredibly detailed. And I don't know, apparently you hold up the light, you can see all sorts of things. I don't know, I don't know what they're looking for, but, but you know what it is, it's, it's to show that the, it's genuine and not monopoly money. Yeah, it's a genuine 10 pound note. Paul wants to reassure his readers that they're genuine Christians. And he could hold them up to the light and look at them and see the genuine telltale watermarks of a real Christian. What are they? They are faith, love, and hope. And so we too can be reassured today, whether or not we have any impressive intellectual ideology, whether we've got any impressive religious disciplines or Impressive spiritual experiences to tell other people about, like the false teachers did. They're actually not the marks of a real Christian. The marks of God's saving work in someone's life, in your life and in mine, is faith in Christ, love for other Christians, and the hope of inheritance in heaven. Those are the marks of real Christians. And if you've got those three things, or you can see them in other people, what do you do about that? You thank God for them. Thank God for them. Thank God for it in your life. Thank God for it in others. That's the first thing. It says you're genuine Christians. If you have faith, love, and hope. Secondly, he says you're trusting the genuine gospel, which is true, fruitful, and about God's grace. You're trusting the genuine gospel. Look at verse, verse 5. He says, And about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel's bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Um, if, if you didn't know, the word gospel does mean good news, but it's not any old good news. Um, in the ancient world, it meant a momentous announcement of the birth of an emperor or a great victory in battle. A God's momentous announcement to his world is about his son, and indeed, it's a message that Paul says elsewhere, it's the power of God for salvation, this message. But it is a message about Jesus. So there are lots of wonderful things in the Bible about God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, about the church and so on. But it's not the gospel unless you're talking about Jesus, because God's gospel is about God's Son. It's, it's, it's interesting, it was promised way back in the Old Testament, so way back in Genesis 12, when God promised Abraham a kingdom for the blessing of all nations. Uh, the New Testament says that was the first version of the gospel because it was promising God's kingdom. And then in Isaiah, there are many promises that a great king would come who would be God coming to save his people. So the Old Testament gospel, if you like, is the promise of a kingdom with a king who will come. And then in the New Testament, of course, the king arrives 
and he's Jesus. And if you look at all the passages as I have that talk about what the gospel is, not just take all the good news, but what does the New Testament actually say the gospel is, specifically say it is, is often summarized in the phrase, Jesus is Christ our Lord. That is, Jesus, the crucified Nazarene, is Christ, the promised Savior King, our Lord, the divine and risen ruler of all. And the New Testament emphasizes four things that he did. He came as our king. He died for our sins. He rose to rule. And he will return to judge. And that message that Jesus is Christ our Lord, who came as our king, died for our sins, rose to rule, and will return to judge, brings wonderful things into our life. Brings God's grace, God's life, God's hope, God's righteousness to anyone who will believe it. That is God's gospel, and that's the gospel we want to proclaim at this church and remind one another of. And Paul says particular things about it here to encourage the Colossians. He says, firstly, it's true. He says, the truth. Christians are not relying on fantasy, but facts. We're not, we're not relying on stories, but, but history. We're not relying on dreams, but reality. So the Christian faith is sensible reliance upon truth that's given to us in the Bible with evidence. It's not the nonsense of the spiritual mysteries that the false teachers were were claiming. We're talking about reality. It's what's so wonderful about the Christian faith. It makes sense of of our lives and of the world. But also, he says, the gospel is fruitful. The gospel is powerful. It changes people. It saves people. And it bears fruit in the good works of people who are gradually being transformed by God's Spirit, even us, through his word. And therefore, as the, the gospel is fruitful, means that it grows in numbers, that is, more and more people are becoming Christians, and that those who are becoming Christians are becoming more and more like Christ in the fruit of the Spirit, in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. A lovely list of spiritual fruitfulness the work of the Spirit in a Christian's life. And it's happening across the world in all cultures. The global spread of the gospel across all cultures is a powerful evidence for its truthfulness because it's not limited to a particular kind of culture. It's not the powerless nonsense of the false teachers, which he says in 2.22, have an appearance of wisdom with self-imposed worship, false humility, harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. The false teacher's religion doesn't actually create spiritual Christ-like change. The gospel of God is dynamic in people's lives. And we've seen that. We've seen that in people becoming Christians. Even during lockdown, people, new people have become Christians at this church and at other churches across the world. Despite this pandemic, the gospel is continuing to grow all over the world. And he says the gospel is about God's grace. You know, it's all about what God has done for us, not about what God is doing in us. We're not here to boast about how much is happening in my life. We're here to proclaim what God has done for us in Christ. Christians trust in God's grace and not in our own religious performance. And it's important to understand, what do people hear from us as a church and from us as individuals? We are stunningly ordinary, broken, screwed up, ordinary people. But we have an extraordinary saviour who is Jesus Christ. And we want to proclaim what God has done for us in him because he is truly wonderful. And so he says to the Colossians, you've heard the true gospel. Thirdly and lastly, he says, you're taught by a genuine teacher. You're genuine Christians who've been taught the genuine gospel by a genuine teacher. He's a faithful minister of Christ. Look at verse 7. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. What a lovely way, by the way, to describe another um, Christian teacher. A dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and also told us of your love in the Spirit. Paul is commending Epaphras, who he's now met. Epaphras has come to to see Paul and spent time with Paul. And um, Paul now knows him. And Paul is commending him by saying three lovely things. Firstly, he's a servant, a fellow servant. In other words, Epaphras is concerned to sacrificially serve other people, which is how Christ has served us. 
He's used his power for the service and for the good of other people, like Jesus. In other words, he is a minister who, who aims to give rather than get from people. There was a greatly needed cleansing of ministry patterns across the evangelical churches in this country at the moment. Um, we need servant-hearted patterns of ministry. As God has served us in Christ, so real Christian ministers will, about, will be about serving rather than using other people. So he's a fellow servant. Servant of the gospel, servant of other people. Second, he says, on our behalf. That is, on behalf of the apostles. In other words, he's teaching the apostolic faith that comes from Christ himself in the Bible. He's not just making it up. He's not just following trajectories from the Bible to try and embrace the evolving ideology of current, current cultural life. He's saying, no, he's, he teaches the apostolic faith, the faith that the apostles teach in the Bible. And thirdly, he says he's faithful. He's loyal and committed to God and his word and to the church. He's a faithful minister. And there's nothing more higher you can say about someone than they're a faithful minister of Christ. And above all, why is he faithful? Because he taught them Christ. He didn't stand each Sunday tell, boasting about his, his um, intellectual ideology or about his um, religious disciplines or about um, his spiritual visionary experiences like the false teachers were doing. He taught them Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you that a faithful minister you can trust, whether in this church or in any other church that you go to, is a minister who teaches you Christ from the Scriptures. If somebody does that, you can trust them. But don't trust somebody who isn't teaching you Christ from the Scriptures. Not teachers who commend their own ideology, their own disciplines, their own experiences to gain a following. But people who proclaim Christ because Christ is all you need. You need Christ. And Christ is everything you'll ever need. So look for ministers who teach Christ and listen to them. So if you are, as I close, trusting in Christ today, don't let anyone make you feel inadequate because you just trust in Jesus. Because when you understand how magnificent Jesus is, that is the most sensible thing to do. And the rest of the letter will remind us of how extraordinary Jesus Christ is. He is everything you'll ever need. And therefore, if you are trusting in him, you can be reassured that you are a genuine Christian if you're marked by faith, love, and hope. Who's heard the genuine gospel. It's all about what God has done in Christ, his graciousness towards us. From a genuine gospel teacher who has taught you all about Jesus. And if that's you, don't let anyone make you feel that faith in Christ is inadequate because they don't know how wonderful Jesus is. Okay? Let's bow our heads and pray together, shall we? Almighty God, we do want to take a moment, as Paul does here in the letter, to thank you for your work in our lives and in other people. Thank you for those of around us here in this room, for those who are watching online, listening at home. And we thank you for your people everywhere, uh, where you have been at work in them. We thank you for those beautiful marks of your saving work in their lives, of faith and love and hope. We thank you for your work in our lives. And we thank you that you've done that through the real gospel, the gospel that's growing all over the world, gospel that's growing in Tanzania, as you were hearing earlier. The gospel that's growing in our lives. The gospel of your grace. Which is all about what you have done for us. It's not about how much we're doing. It's about what you've done for us in Christ. And we praise you for him. And we thank you that for those faithful ministers who've taught us. Perhaps it was parents or a, or a Sunday school teacher or a, uh, a friend or a minister who's taught us all about Jesus Christ. Thank you for those who have faithfully ministered on behalf of the apostles and told us about Jesus Christ. And we do cry out to you, Lord God, that you'd help us to resist those who want to make our faith in, in Jesus seem inadequate and want to promote their own approach. Please help us to have confidence in Jesus, not in ourselves, 
but in how wonderful and magnificent Jesus Christ is so that we will be able to remain confident that he is all we need and that we might stand firm in him and proclaim him with confidence to others. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Uh, the wonderful and magnificent Jesus Christ came as our matchless king to rule, crown him with many crowns. today.